Hey everyone, I am so excited to be here with Aussie Dave Adamson. We are going to have a great conversation here today. And as you chime in, we would love to know where you are logging in from. So as you join the call, we'll invite some of you to uh, let us know where you're from. But we are going to, uh, let me go ahead and share this out to my community as well, Dave. That's a great idea. Um, Dave, where are you today? Uh, so I am coming to you from my house in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, actually, just I, I'm about um, maybe 40, 45 minutes north of Atlanta. And man, I got to tell you, like everything is just it is so quiet outside. Um, typically, Atlanta traffic. Uh, I don't know if you've been to Atlanta before, but Atlanta traffic is, is notorious. But everything is so quiet at the moment, and yeah, it's 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 an interesting time that we're living in, right? It's an interesting season, and um, I'm noticing a lot of people uh, are thankfully staying uh, isolated and staying quarantined uh, as we're supposed to do. But you know, as I've been thinking, Phil, and as you and I have been sort of texting each other and everything, my my hope out of this, you know, I heard somebody say uh, during the week that isolation breeds uh, creativity, and my hope is that the capital c church learns to be creative during this time and that the capital c church once this is all over and let's you know uh, the great thing is we're going to get through this right we're going to come onto the other side of this at some point we believe that god's going to get us through this my hope is that the capital c church just doesn't go back to just business as usual once everything goes back to normal you know what i mean so yeah i'm in atlanta and and um yeah it's a very interesting time that we're in Yeah, and I'm here in Wichita, Kansas, and we're not in any kind of quarantine yet, uh, as many other parts of the country are. But what I'm seeing is a lot fewer cars on the road and a lot more dogs walking their people. (laughs) (laughs) So literally, I'm I'm watching that through the windows, and that's quite interesting. But I agree. Um, I was on a call just an hour ago with my friend Pete Vargas, and he was praying something very similar to what you just said, that God is going to birth new things to this. And this is not to at all take away from the tragedy that's going on and the people who are losing loved ones and our hearts are going out and we want to pray for sure that God will stop this, that we won't see this continue to bring the kind of decimation that it looks like. Like mathematically, the way it looks scientifically, this is, it's scary, right? But... And so we want to pray about that, but that's not the point of the conversation today is I want to really talk and lean into your experience because you've been doing online ministry for for quite a while. So we're going to talk about things that we can learn. And there's kind of two different groups of people I want to see us talk to today. And that is I want to talk to church leaders who are trying to figure out, hey, we've not been doing a whole lot in this whole realm of online digital ministry. And we're kind of in deep water right now. We just got thrust out. How do we do that? How do we care for our flock when we can't see them face to face? I can't go to coffee with someone. I can't lead a class at church when I preach. The current the sanctuary is now empty um, as I'm turning on my camera and my microphone. So I want to talk to that audience. What does ministry look like today that's that maybe wasn't possible before? But I also want to talk to the digital person, not only the guy, but the man or the woman, the the boy or girl, the senior, whoever, whatever age they are. How do we find community? How do we live out our faith and find resources to feed our faith? But then as you talked about the new visions and dreams. So I want to talk about that. But before we go there, Dave, um, I know you started out as a reporter in Australia. Uh, Real quick, how did you get from being a reporter to being a social media pastor? Yeah, great question, man. So yeah, for, for like the last seven or eight years that I was in Australia, I was a TV reporter for uh, our version, uh, essentially our version of ESPN Sports Center, a TV show there, and I, I did that for seven or eight years. And little did I know at that point, like I had no plans to, to ever go into full time ministry. I had no plans to ever be a pastor. That's that's for sure. But um, you know, God had other plans. And so what I realize now, looking back, and, and hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? So looking back, I realized that God was building up in me some skills in the in the media space in the tv space he was building up in me some skills that he would later uh, combine with the uh vision that he has placed in my heart so he takes the skills that he puts in your hand and he compares he 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 
partners that with the the vision that he places in your heart. And so, you know, uh, I had just turned down a job at ESPN Sports Center. It was the end of uh, like 2007, start of 2008. I turned down a job with ESPN Sports Center and didn't know what I was doing with my life. But my wife and I were very confident that I was not supposed to take this position, which would have been my dream job, like the thing that I had been working my whole life towards and didn't know what to do with my life. And so I contacted a pastor friend and he said, you know, I've been thinking about starting a, a thing called Church Online. I don't know if you've heard of it, but I need somebody with pastorals, uh, you know, a pastor's heart, but with skills in the media. And you seem like you might be the guy. And so the long story short is I quit my career, sold my house, sold my cars and flew to New Jersey and, and became an online pastor in 2008. So I've been doing this whole online streaming thing for quite a long time now. You know, as I look back, um, you know, I've been doing it right from the very beginning almost. I think uh, Life Church started there, and, and then, the, you know, known as the church that first started Church Online, they started in 2007. So I wasn't too far behind that. And, and it's been interesting in time now that, you know, the church is in the position, the Capital C Church is in the position that it's in where people are streaming for the first time. I've been on phone calls, Phil, this past week with. Um, you know, I want to say probably anywhere between 60 to 80 churches um, across the U.S. and especially in Australia. Uh, a lot of the uh, churches I spoke to were Australian churches who had never done this before. And I was so thrilled to be able to leverage this, the, the experience that God's given me to, to help these churches get, get online services up and running for, the, for some for the very first time. It's been, it's been very interesting. Yeah, and I don't want to spend our time talking today about the technology because there's a lot of resources and people can follow up with you or many others like Life Church, for example, yeah. I know has a platform that I heard just last night. They gave it away to 10,000 churches this week uh, to use yeah. their church online platform, which, you know, is a very effective way to do it. Um, there's a lot of people doing that, but I, what I'd love to focus on, let's start with your pastor's heart. And I know you're at North Point uh, Ministries in Atlanta with Andy Stanley now, um, but you have a ministry that's much broader than that. Like you use Instagram to share daily devotions and you've got a reach yeah. that's, that's much broader. But let's talk to church leaders. Like how do we need to think differently about ministry in this online space? Not just today with this urgency of the situation we're in, but like, what are some things that you've learned that will help us think differently about how to care for the flocks that are following us today? Yeah, this is a real paradigm shift. I think we're at this, uh, you know, the, the current situation ha has caused us to get to this real point of decision where, where um, you know, we, I think we need to, to change our paradigm. Typically in church world, it's easy for us to essentially function as an events-based organization. The, the church is typically functioning as that you know all of our uh, uh, well at least the majority of our resources both time talent and a uh, budget go towards producing a sunday service um whereas now that that idea has that that concept has been ripped away from us because the, our doors have had to close because of the, the current pandemic that's on and so we have to shift that paradigm i believe from being an events-based organization to being a media creation and distribution organization that's what we are able to do now i've just ha luckily happened to be in that space for a long period of time where i believed that um the the future of the church is if we make that shift and start figuring out the best way to distribute the content that we have you know i, I wasn't always a christian phil and and i didn't become a christian until i was a senior in high school and and I remember being told right from the moment that I started attending church and became a follower of Jesus when I was like 17 years old, my pastors would always say, church is not a building, it's the people. Yet my experience has always been, but everything's focused around the building. Yet now the building has been taken away and it really does come down to the people. And so apart from that paradigm shift, I think what we need to be doing as church leaders is just leveraging the technology that has, has been available to us for more than a decade to connect with people. You know, I've said for a long time, and I'm sure you've heard me say this before as well, Phil, you know, we get to um, we get to meet in person for one hour each week, but we get to meet and engage for the other 167 hours a week online. And we do that through social media. We do that through Facebook. We do that through 
uh, Twitter and Instagram, like you said. Um, so I've been leveraging Instagram for a little while now to not just do Bible devotions. I'm currently in a series for the for 2020 where I'm literally teaching 50,000 people to speak Hebrew um, through my Instagram feed every single day. Like it's it's crazy. But now even I'm trying to step up my game. Like yesterday I did a just an Instagram live and just said, hey, to the people who are on, hey, how can I pray for you? And I literally stopped and just prayed for the people who would typically read my devotions. And, and, and it's not that I'm disconnected from them because I'm very connected and engage a lot. But I had the opportunity to, for them to see my face and, and just pray with them. And as people were putting prayer requests for their mother-in-law, I would stop and just go, God, I'm just going to pray for that woman right now. I, I'm just going to ask that you would you would provide her and bring her a sense of peace. Like We have the opportunity now to be even more connected than ever before because rather than just meeting once a week on Sunday or maybe just having a cup of coffee during the week and, and maybe you get to see the people from your church community twice a week, you people are carrying church around in their pocket. And this is the time where we have to jump into this and start leveraging the tools that we have. I've said before that... Um, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, my theology around online technology and my theology around leveraging social media to pastorally care for people is that we are doing the same thing that the Apostle Paul did. You know, the Apostle Paul leveraged the technology of his day to grow the church, to connect people with God and to teach uh, biblical concepts and theology. Now, the technology of his day was letter writing, right? Um, for us, the technology of our day is social media. It's YouTube. It's it's Instagram. So we just need to be exactly the same as him. I love that, and I like what you're saying because there, you know, we do have the, the Sunday worship service, which is something that's even biblically prescribed. Like we're to gather, we're to worship. God's shown us yeah. how to do that, but we have the ability to create media that connects people one to few or one to many in a way that really meets the needs of our community of our congregation, of the, the mission field that we're trying to reach, um, as it were, because Paul himself, he went to the Agora, and he sat there and he talked about the issues of the day. And so mm -hmm. he adapted his communication style to talk in their way of communicating. And I think yeah. what you're suggesting is we need to figure out what that means um, this, this is a different direction. I thought we were going to go, but of course you're a media guy. So of course this is where we're going to go. So um, if you were going to be starting today, let's say you were one of these pastors that's all of a sudden thrust into, I've got to figure out how to take my physical analog church and become a digital pastor. What are three things that you would do immediately that you think would be most important? Oh, gosh, I don't know if I could narrow it down to just three things. Or what are a couple of things, a couple of things that come to mind. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so first of all, I, I would encourage, I'd be encouraging pastors to get more active on social media, but recognize, you know, in social media world, we're often told that content is king. I think content is queen. I think engagement is king. That's where I think we get it a little bit wrong. Um, we need to be engaging, especially from a, a, a church leader, a pastoral point of view. It's great that you can get your content out there, but we want the content to engage and it needs to meet certain needs that people have in the physical community. So I would say, first of all, get really active on your social media accounts. Don't just leave it to a streaming service that you might do on Sunday, for example. Get active during the week. Realistically, uh, a lot of pastors are probably thinking, hey, I've got a lot to do that I would normally do, but some of the stuff that, that I would typically do during the week has been taken off my plate. What if you reallocated that time to leveraging an hour a day to get onto social media and just do a live Instagram and, and, and encourage your people to pray for them and to take live prayer requests? What if you took an hour of your day to get onto Facebook and just respond to people and let them know you're praying for them? What if you got a little bit more active on your social media accounts and let people know, this is what I'm doing right now? You know, I think in church world, um, we there, there, there are probably about five human needs that we all have every single day. And we try to meet them physically in the church, but we can still meet some of those uh, digitally as well. You know, people want to know, people are dealing with fear and anxiety at the minute. So talk about that on your social media feeds. Tell people realistically and just raw how you're dealing with this season of fear and anxiety that's around. 
people feeling isolated and alone. Talk to your people about how you're dealing with that and, and what scripture relates to what you're currently going through and feeling. I think um, what I've seen a lot of churches do, and you know, we're recording this on a Sunday afternoon, and I've been watching my, my feed get filled up with online streams from Facebook and online streams from YouTube, right? I'm sure you're exactly the same. Um, and, and a lot of what I'm seeing is people just replicating what would typically happen in the building on Sunday. You know, it's a stage, it's maybe a few less musicians than typical, but really they're just replicating the same thing. I don't think we need to do that. I think this is an authentic moment in the life and the history of the church where we can just have a pastor get on, you know, sit in his living room and just do a, a, a Zoom call to his parishioners, just, just do a Facebook Live and say, hey, I'm in my living room because just like you, I'm stuck at home. I'm quarantined. I, I, I'm, I'm isolated. Like, I think we've got the opportunity now, not more than ever, but I think it's just now a real thing that there are common emotions, common needs in the community, and we just need to be real about how we're dealing with them. You know, Phil, you know, my, you know part of my story. I, I, I've got three girls um, and my wife. We're all stuck at home. We're going a little bit stir crazy. I'm trying to tell my people who are following me on whatever channel they're following me on, hey, I'm just like you. I'm struggling with the fear and anxiety of this whole coronavirus thing. So I'm reading these scriptures. I'm studying this passage or this story to help me get through that 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 moment. And I'm just trying to share what realistically I'm going through myself because I'm assuming everybody else is going through it as well. That's a really good point. You know, I think the opportunity to pray with people that we would do if we could go to the hospitals, like, I don't know if it's this way in Atlanta, but in Wichita, we're not allowed as pastors to go into the hospital um, unless you're the patient, basically. I don't even know that they're allowing family to come in and visit. They're putting some pretty strict um, requirements in place, which it makes sense yeah. that they would do that. So, but we can pray here, like you and I, literally, if there's someone with a prayer request, and by the way, we're talking about engagement. If you're watching this, and you've got a prayer request or you've got a question for us, post that. We're watching because we would love to engage with you um, and make this relevant to what you're concerned about. But I think that is a huge opportunity to show a side of ourselves that we wouldn't normally show. Like, you know, I don't know that any pastor I've ever worked with or even myself that I've ever talked about the process of preparing a sermon, talked Mm -hmm. about how we prepare for worship on Sunday um, or any other thing during the week. We're usually focused on doing something and then unveiling it when it's finished, right? And I know one of the things people love on social media is the behind-the-scenes glimpses into what we're doing. So I think that's a brilliant idea right there. Yeah, I agree. It's just that opportunity to let people into our world because really we most of us can't stream from a studio or can't stream from a church uh, that's set up as a studio almost, like a broadcast campus, because it requires so many people to be involved and we're trying to keep the limit of that down, right? So so I think if we can be, you know, we've known this, because I know you and I have been in the social media world for, for a long period of time, and we've known that there's an authenticity to social media, that when people are, are raw and authentic and show those behind the scenes, that's what really connects and engages with an audience. But in the church world, we've tried to not do that. We've tried to keep the wizard behind the veil almost, right? And only show things when they're done and polished. Well, now's the opportunity for us to say, no, no, no. Look, I'm doing this from my house and my house is messy because we're all just trying to get through and trying to get through a day and, and my kids are, are going stir crazy. Um, so I'm going to step outside to do a prayer. Like those sorts of things are huge at the moment. They, these are the sorts of things that that we can do as as church leaders and as pastors, as people who want to minister to people through this uh, through this hard, difficult, chaotic season, we need to let them know we're in the chaos with you. We're up to our neck in anxiety and fear, and we've got loved ones who are at risk because they've got they're either older or they've got pre-existing conditions. Like we're experiencing the same thing, and this is how we're getting through it. I would love for pastors to be really rare, uh, really raw, and really authentic during this moment. So one of the things we've been doing as a church is um, at North Point is our worship team has been streaming live worship all last week onto our YouTube channel. So we've just been streaming it from their house. And sometimes it's it's a guy who knows how to play guitar really well, but he's doing it on his iPhone. And so it kind of looks very cropped and it's, you know, the audio is not everything that we would typically want it to be. 
And, you know, tonight we're going to be streaming another one uh, at 8 o'clock at North Point Worship on YouTube. And I was looking at the video today because we're going to simulate it live. I was looking at the video today, and, and what I loved about it was, A, there were like eight people in the room, all six feet apart, so there was that social distancing happening, right? Which, again, very real and very raw. They're in somebody's living room. They've got minimal mic, like two microphones set up to capture. So the audio isn't pristine, as it normally would be for one of the products that we produce. And then the guy starts, one of the leaders starts leading the first song. And as he's, he's reading from scripture, and then he starts playing the guitar, and he's playing the wrong song. And he goes, hang on. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm, I haven't got the right song. I was caught off by what I was reading. And so somebody else helps him start the song again. And typically we would cut that out. And, and But in this instance, I was like, that is the essence of what people are feeling right now. They're, they're just they're doing their best just to keep their head above water. So let's keep that in because it's so real. It's so authentic and it's so raw, but it's also so honest. And that's the thing that I love about it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think... Uh we are all just trying to figure this out as we go. And the beautiful thing that we've got available to us uh, is the Holy Spirit is the one doing the ministry and we are completely reliant. We know this, you know, as pastors during the week, whenever you go visit someone, you're hoping that God's going to give you a word uh, because <laughs> you, you're, we don't have all the answers. But right now, we really don't have all the answers and we're yeah. trying to figure out how to stay ahead of this. And the rules are changing every day. Like, are we going to be meeting together in person for Easter? Probably not, but we don't know, right? Depends where you live, maybe, and yeah. how large your congregation is and all these kinds of things. Uh, so we're figuring it out as we go. And I think that's actually really valuable is to be able to show that to others that, hey, I'm still, I'm right there with you. I, I yeah, yeah. get what you're feeling. Those are the emotions I'm having as well, because I think that helps us feel not alone, like to know they're that's, that's what I love whenever I go to a prayer group and I share something I'm wrestling with. When someone else says, hey, I'm wrestling with that too, all of a sudden you realize, okay, I'm not the only person on the planet who's trying to figure this out. And that makes you feel like you're part of something bigger. And that's what we all want to feel. It doesn't have to be a thousand people, 5,000 people, 300,000 people apparently yeah. are yeah. part of Life Church on a given weekend. Um, yeah. I don't know what your, what North Point is. That's a lot of people, but yeah. you don't connect with 300,000 people. You connect like this, one to one. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, you know, uh, what I think is interesting about that, I, and I know, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about the technology side of it, but really, I think we're actually talking about what happens when you remove some of the technology? The conversations that I've had this week, Phil, have all been about, hey, how do I stream and and what what gear do I need and what bandwidth and you know what software and and you know look, I've answered all of those questions and, and I mean I'm more than happy to talk about that because the technology is plays a role in it, right? But one of the things that I keep getting to and one of the things I keep coming back to during the season is it's not about the technology. It's not about the lighting that you have. It's not about uh, the software that you're using. It's about the authenticity. It's about letting people know I'm in this with you, man. I, I'm struggling as well and I'm suffering with fear and I didn't sleep well last night because of it. But you know what? I still believe that God is on the throne. I still believe that he's in charge and I still believe he's not done with us because we're not finished yet. Um, and so all of those things that come into play, I would be encouraging church leaders to not worry about the software and what platform you should stream to and whether or not you've got the greatest microphone or the greatest DSLR, just be real with people. That's what is the most important, I think. Of all the things that I've posted, of all the things that I've done on social media this week, I think the thing that is most connected is when I get on Instagram Live and I just say to people, hey, I'm struggling, I need prayer. If I need it, I bet you need it as well. So I just want to take 10 minutes just to pray for you guys. What? Give me your prayer requests and let, let's just spend some time praying together. That has been the thing that's most connected because it's the most real. It's the most honest. It's the most authentic. Now, I, I want to share something else, too, is we don't have to just think about the one to many kinds of opportunities that we have. Yeah. Like when you post something like that, you don't know who's going to show up. But technology makes it possible for us to do what we're doing right here. So if you see someone reach out, like when you do a stream like that, who shares a request, you could take it private. 
and you could yeah. use you know messenger you could use facetime you can use whatever technology is comfortable and get on camera because i think there's something powerful my, my mom is in her 80s and just recently we got her on facetime and she loves that she can connect with family and see them and not just yeah. hear them and i think there's yeah. something about what we're doing here i can see your smile i can see your eyes right i can we yeah. we know we're here together and while i can't reach out and, and touch you um i feel like we're connected in a little bit yeah. different way and the technology makes it possible today yeah. even you know 11 12 years ago when you first started technology was not reliable for this kind of engagement we so we tried it we had it but it wasn't reliable and yeah. so i think that is something that as church leaders we can be doing and, you know, let's pivot this conversation because this is man in the pew and we're talking to the digital guy in the pew. Um, yeah. The guy in the pew can be doing the same thing. You can be, yeah. we can be reaching out not only to pastors, but to peers. And if we're feeling isolated and alone, and uh, one of my friends posted today said, hey, I'm an extrovert, introverts help me. How do I cope with this quarantine thing? Um, I think technology can actually be one of those things. What would, yeah. would you say to that? Yeah, I completely agree. As a, as an extrovert myself, um, <laughs> this has been <laughs> this has been a little bit difficult. Not going to lie, but one of the things I try to do is there's there's a handful of guys, and, and I'm sure it's the same for you. There's a handful of guys, and we would call that iron sharpening iron. We would, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's it, not necessarily a men's group, but I would call it in Hebrew. I would call it them. I tell me the people. The friends who I cling to, who I'm stuck to like glue is a Hebrew word. Talmid literally means that word, that you're stuck like uh, stuck like glue. And so from that point of view, I would be saying uh, that they're these people who I reach out to. And I don't know what you know about Enneagrams, um, Phil, but I'm an Enneagram 3, which means I'm a bit extroverted. And one of my friends is an Enneagram 7, which means he wants to be surrounded by people. And so him and I have been texting a lot today, especially, and during the week, where we have that connection. And you know what? This is the thing. So many people I've heard in the past, you know, since 2008 have said to me, but online, online, online relationships are not real relationships. I would disagree with that. You know, not, I would disagree with it in a number of different ways. First of all, my daughter, my eldest daughter, one of her best friends in the whole world is a girl who she used to be friends with in Australia before we moved to the US. They speak to each other every other, you know, maybe every other month on, you know, in a video chat but they connect all the time on social media and their relationship is still close. I would look at you and I. You and I talk mostly through Instagram direct message, right? But you get onto this phone call with me and what's the first thing I ask you? I ask you about some stuff you had texted me about your health during the past week, right? Right. So that's a connection, that's real, it's a real thing. And if you're still doubting it, let's look at cyberbullying, hmm. right? right? Cyberbullying is real, it hurts thousands and thousands of students and kids every single week that's because what happens online is real and i read a study recently that said mentally your brain is wired that whether you're in front of me right now phil across the table from me or i'm looking at you through a video screen right now my brain registers this as real as a pastor i remember when i first got into full-time ministry and started doing weddings I would ask all the time in the pre-marital counseling stuff, I would ask, hey, how did you guys meet? And typically it was, we met at church, we met at work, we met at school, whatever it might be. And then as the years progress, I can tell you 70 to 80% of the couples I marry now met online. That's real. It's a real relationship that just started out in this digital space and then eventually became physical. Um, I remember last year, I don't know if you remember this, Phil, but I, I wrote a blog post. I actually wrote a blog post two years ago that one year ago got picked up by Fox News. They ran it on their, uh, on the front page of foxnews.com and it, they gave it the heading, uh, Church as we know it is over, here's what's next. And it was all about online technology. It was about how I was encouraging churches to make sure that they, um, you know, had multiple channels, not just physical, but they had apps, they had uh, Twitter accounts, so, uh, Facebook accounts, YouTube, live stream, all of this sort of stuff. And that that post that they did, and, and I'll make sure to leave uh, a link to that post in the comment section, but that post had, to date, I think it's had like 7,000 comments, 6,990 of which were against that idea. And the reason they were against it, they kept quoting Hebrews 10 to me. 
do not give up meeting together, right? <laughs> meeting together. But for me, I always was like, this is not a Hebrews 10 issue. This is a Mark 16 issue. Because in Mark 16, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. So all the world includes Skype. It includes Facebook. It includes Twitter. It includes YouTube. It includes online streaming. And the reason it in- those things are included is because there, are, there is a generation of people who are not going to ever set foot in the church because they don't feel it's relevant or they've got PTSD from a bad church experience. So we need to go into the world and meet them and preach the gospel to them, preach the good news to them. What is the good news? Well, the good news is simply Jesus went around preaching the good news before the cross, before the resurrection. The good news was that the kingdom of God is here. I believe to the core of my being that feel right now between you and I, the kingdom of God is here because yeah. we're gathered. We are gathered. We're talking about godly things and we're encouraging the church. People who are watching this video on demand later on on, on, on YouTube or Facebook, wherever it's going to be, the kingdom of God is here as well because God leverages that. God is in the pixels that, um, that are forming this conversation and forming this video. So, you know, we, we have to worry about the technology, yes, but it's the heart behind the technology, I think. We have to be high tech. But high tech alone is nothing from a Christian point of view unless we're high touch as well. And that comes not just through physical contact. It comes through emotional connection, relational connection. It's me saying, hey, Phil, man, how's your mom doing? Why do I say that? Because we've got a, phys- uh, we've got a digital connection, right? That enhances the physical. Yeah. I, you know, and I'm not going to ever say we shouldn't have face-to-face because we need the face-to-face. And I believe... Agreed the church is going to move to -to face-to-face again, and we're going to be talking in in eight weeks or so about, hey, how do you take these online relationships offline and make them meaningful? And and then how do we do both? Like that, to me, has been on my heart the last couple of years is there's a lot of people I know that I work with because my full-time job is in the digital world with Social Media Examiner, and I'm, I'm not actually a pastor technically anymore, although I think once a pastor, always a pastor, right? Because your your heart's always as a pastor. But I, but I, what I, I want to stop you for one second. You are a (laughs) pastor by purpose, if not by position. Phil, that's one thing I know about you. You are a pastor by purpose, if not by position. Amen. And I receive that. But what I would say is my heart has been for people who are like me, and I've been here, but people who spend a good part of their week in relationships like this all over the world, they've got a lot of relationships. And then when they come into their offline relationships with their family, with their church, even they don't know how to bridge that because they've had these dynamic relationships and they're seeing things happen and they're talking about things that really resonate with them. And then when you come offline, um, everyone doesn't understand it. I think the, the, the game is shifting because of what's happening right now, where that's going to be a lot easier for people to understand what it's like because everyone is being forced to figure out how do I do relationships online. Um, and now we're going to have to all figure out what does that mean in our offline world and relationships. So I think that's an exciting opportunity that we have. And it's not an easy one to navigate. Yeah, I completely agree. We, we have to embrace this. And this is what I mean by this is what I mean by I hope the church doesn't go back to business as usual. I hope that we actually become uh, organizations that, you know, the, the term that I've been using for a couple of years now is is we become organizations that are omni-channel, hmm. um, not multi-channel, but omni-channel. Multi-channel is when, you know, you think of a swimming pool, you know, your local community swimming pool with all the buoys in, in you know, the lane buoys in line. And so this lane is for fast swimmers, this lane is for slower swimmers, whatever. That's multi-channel. Each channel has its own strategy, its own system. Omni-channel is when you take the buoys out and everybody's allowed to free swim wherever they want to go. And so when I think omni-channel, I think that's the church saying, hey, physically meeting, super important. Online connections, super important. Uh, Watching our messages on demand on YouTube or listening on podcasts, super important. We want to be in your world as often as possible. Beyond just the one hour on Sunday, we want to be in in your life and engaging with you for the other 167 hours of, of the week on social media. Like that's what I mean by omni-channel, everything working together. We see the business world has been doing this for a while, right? I, I, 
I often use the the um, you know if we wanted to buy a lawnmower right now, you and I, we could go down to Walmart. Let's assume that the the coronavirus isn't an issue. We could go down to Walmart and search the lawnmower aisle for 45 minutes, then eventually buy one, come back and mow your lawn, Phil. Or we could get online on Amazon, buy one, and um, you know then then um, uh, have it shipped to us in two days, and, and we could mow your lawn in two days. Well. The physical seems better at that point, but there's an alternative option because Home Depot allows me to get online, shop for the lawnmower that I want, and then I just have to drive there and go straight to the online pickup, and I'm out the door instead of 45 minutes, I'm out the door in five minutes. That's omnichannel. That's technology working hand in hand with physical, right? Digital working with physical. That's how I think the church needs to progress moving forward. We do need to meet together in person. I do believe that. And I'm not saying take that away, but we have to enhance that physical connection with digital presence during the week where somebody can have me, a pastor, in their in their pocket every single day where I can leverage this as a pulpit, not just as a phone. Like that's when we start to shift a little bit. That's when the game starts to get changed. All right. So let's talk about something that's sticky for pastors <laughs> since – <laughs> since we're, we're talking about this um, omni-channel means you may not control where everybody goes so yeah. let's use your example of the lawnmower and I might go online and I might do a search on Amazon I might go find other resources that say this is the best lawnmower to buy and then I go find where's the best price and then I decide it's going to be Home Depot I'm not loyal to Home Depot I went there because they have the best price and they're maybe the closest to me and I can go pick it up. Um, yeah. So this brings up an issue. So you're, you're at North Point. Life Church yeah. is another huge church that has a lot of online resources and you actually write for them, right? Because isn't you version owned by Life Church? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, so I'm a pastor and I would love to be the one that's feeding my flock all the time. But the reality is they're getting fed and they're being served by a lot of churches right now. So how do we need to think about that? Like it has changed. Like the, what people are doing during the week, they might listen to this podcast that we're going to, this is going to get turned into a podcast that's coming from me. It's not even a church. It's a, it's a parachurch, right? Or they might be going to Life Church and, or, you know, whatever church it might be that you like the pastor and what he's had to say about this. And maybe they're not as interested in what you p prepared this week. You prepared your great message on Psalm 46, which is amazing. But they're like, you know, I'm not feeling Psalm 96. I want to go hear something on Psalm 91. And so they go look that up. Um, how do we as pastors need to be thinking about the content that's available what we are personally responsible for preparing uh, for our flock and and how people are consuming it. Yeah, such a great question, man, because this is the reality of the world we live in. As you said, the average person who follows Jesus has the option to go to their local church and listen to uh, their local pastor. But then I would I would argue that probably a lot of them are either listening to Andy Stanley on podcast or listening to Craig Rochelle on podcast or Rick Warren or Judah Smith or Carl Lentz uh, or Rich Wilkerson, whoever. Like there's so many, um, there's so many well-known pastors in the world right now who, who, who are producing fantastic content, right? So the average, the average Christian, the average follower of Jesus has the option to do that anyway. Like they prob and they probably are. I know for me, Yes, I attend North Point. I watch Andy Stanley every single week, whether it's live or in person. Typically, it's both. I usually watch in the morning online, but then I go to the 4.30 service. Um, but I still listen to Rich Wilkinson Jr. I still listen to Craig Rochelle. I still watch Judas Smith. And, and, you know, or I read their blogs or I read their Instagram accounts where they're putting out, out content just in a different format. So we all do that anyway. Like I, I think that that's the reality. Like I said to you earlier, I've got 50,000 people who read my devotions every single day and are learning Hebrew through me this year because of what I'm posting on Instagram, right? And so I know there's all these people who are coming to my content, but they go to their own church. And they go to their own church for a reason. And the reason is that I can't meet their physical need in the way that their local pastor can. That's the difference. The local pastor has the capacity to meet their physical needs, to know their children's names, to care for their children and love on their children through a student program or through a kids ministry program 
that is encouraging their kids to develop a faith of their own. You know, they're the things that the local church can do that a YouTube channel can't or a podcast channel can't do. They, They can provide great content, but it's really that focused effort. What I think most churches need to do, in my opinion, is they need to be putting out as much content as possible themselves and recognizing that you know, church attendance isn't necessarily decreasing, it's just decentralizing. People aren't just accessing your content if you're a local pastor, they're not just accessing your content in person anymore, they're probably watching on YouTube or they're watching on your website or they're watching on or they're listening on a podcast on their commute into work because, you know, studies have shown that even the 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 average church attender isn't attending church anymore. We, it used to be once a week, and then it's, it, it went out to uh, twice a month, and I, now I think it's once every five to six weeks. doesn't mean that they're not accessing or, or consuming your content. It probably just means they're consuming your content in other ways other than just physically. So for me, you know, what what I love about the local church, and by local church, I mean, is the local church near your house that is local to you that you can attend, is that gives you the opportunity to know people, to serve the people who are in your community, and to be in small groups where you are known by the people in your small group. That can't happen if I'm in Atlanta and I'm listening to Craig Rochelle in Oklahoma. That can't happen if I'm in Atlanta and I'm listening to Judah Smith in 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 Seattle or if I'm listening to Brian Houston in Sydney, Australia, you know, that that local physical connection cannot happen in those instances. So, you know, one of the things we say at North Point all the time, and, and this is like the, the a testament to the genius of Andy Stanley, he always says, uh, we uh, circles are better than rows. We learn in rows, but we grow in circles. And by circles, he means a small group. And that implies local, that implies physical. Now, even today, it, when we're in the middle of a pandemic that is requiring us to stay home for a minimum of like two to three weeks, we're not sure uh, exactly how long, and you can't gather in, in groups of more than 10 right now, there is there is still so much technology out there that allows you to meet with those small group people that you've built relationship with. And one of the questions I've had this past week, Phil, is, well, how do I do small group online? What, like, all right, you, I'll, I'll use Zoom because I might just throw Zoom out as an option, right? I'll use Zoom, but how do we, what happens when we're all on the Zoom? How do we run the small group? Well, you run it the way you'd normally run it. Somebody starts talking and somebody starts sharing and, and everybody else comes in and starts sharing their own struggles or their own praise points or whatever, and you just, you just do it digitally. Um, and stay connected to those people. That's how, as a, that's how, as an extrovert, I'm surviving this at the minute. I've got a, a bunch of guys, a bunch of male friends who are texting me nonstop things that they're seeing on Twitter, or hey, this is what I saw today, or this is what I'm struggling with, or are you struggling with this as well? And you know, we'll have those sort of conversations where we're still sharpening each other and still supporting each other. That can only happen when you're in a local church. So it doesn't matter where people are getting their content from. You as a local church pastor, you as a local church leader, which I believe every person who is listening to this podcast or watching this on YouTube or Facebook, you're a church leader. If you follow Jesus and you're in your church, then you've you've got a mandate to lead in your community. And so you just need to be real, authentic, and available, even if it means being available on Instagram, in the comments, on Facebook, on Twitter. For me, Phil, I don't know, you, you probably have seen me do this. I give out my... I give out my cell phone number to people on, on my Instagram. It's feed. on your Instagram feed. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. text me. Text me your prayer request because this is the most, like texting is the most intimate thing. When it, In a digital world, I can I can get direct messages on Facebook that I, 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 I saw some today. I hadn't even seen people wishing me a happy birthday from December and I hadn't even seen them yet. But when somebody texts me, you better believe, you know, text has a 97% open rate, 97%. And I would say it's actually, that's undercutting it. Why don't you start texting the people in your small group? Hey, men in your church, why don't you start texting the other men? In fact, I would go as far as to encourage you to do this. Why don't you text your pastor and encourage them? Tell them, I'm praying for you. Tell them that. Because your pastor is in this unique situation at the minute. They have never led through a pandemic before. They're making this up as they go also. They've never preached 
potentially to a camera before. They're also stressed and anxious about their own family's Hmm. health. Hmm. So why don't you let them know right now that you're praying for them. In fact, I would encourage you to stop the podcast, stop the live stream, and just text your pastor and say, hey, I'm praying for you right now because I know that this is stressful for you as, as it is for me. But thank you for leading me. I'm praying God will give you courage and God will give you peace and God will give you discernment and wisdom to get through this and to lead our church through this. Amen. And I would say also be gracious because they haven't been through, none of us have been through this before. So we're making mistakes. We're not going to get it right. Um, and we, we may only get eight weeks to figure this out. But as you've already said, we hope it's the new reality that this leads yeah. us into new things. Let's, yeah. let's back up just a second. You, you said something earlier. Um, you know, the church is now disseminated. I forget exactly the way you said it, but we're you know, we're, we're in circles and we're growing um, and we need different kinds of content, different kinds of ways that we are getting input, sorry, um, from the church. So how, how would you think about that as, you know, we talk in my world about being a media company. How do we become media churches that are creating the right kinds of content for our flock? What, what types of things should we be doing? Because, you know, we are going to the, yeah, yeah. the different famous pastors that you talked about for certain kinds of things. And we've always done that. We, we went to the bookstores. We would go to the bookstores and buy their books, yeah. right? It, yeah. It's really not that different, except now we can do it every week instead of you know every year when they came out with their new book of the, the sermons they've given or whatever. Um, but what other kinds of content are you talking about? Yeah, I think, um, again, uh, one of the things that I've realized uh, during this period and as I've talked to churches is they want to produce this really excellent, well-produced, uh, high-quality content, right? And I think that's great. If you're capable of doing that, please keep doing that, especially when it comes to audio. I think audio is super key when it comes to producing anything online. But the content that you can produce is a li- could be a little bit different. For example, so we have six uh, six churches in Atlanta, six uh, you know as part of our church network. And typically, what happens is, and especially currently. Uh, all of our churches are in the middle of a series that's being taught by Andy Stanley. So all six churches are taking this one live stream from Andy Stanley. But one of our ch- one of our churches that is closest to Atlanta, they've decided, hey, that's great. We're going to do that. But what the pastor has decided is I'm going to do 10 minute podcasts from now on every single day where I'm uh, telling people how they can get connected into the community, how they can serve the community through things like uh, food drives or blood drives, you know, things like that, that are, are really needed and I'm going to give them the details of how they can do that. or I'm going to interview somebody who is um, uh, world renowned for being a, sort of a, somebody who works from home and gets a lot of stuff done I'm going to interview them and help you get better at working from home for example um, and so he's their church is just producing these 10 minute podcasts that are coming out every single day they're filming them and they're putting them out to YouTube as well so there's a 10 minute piece of content for YouTube, a 10 minute audio uh, piece of content for for podcast and allowing people to consume it in the way that suits them the best. So that's just one example of a church doing something a little bit different. They've never done that before, but they realize that they need to be content distributors during this time and not an events-based organization, a content distributing uh, organizations. So that's one thing that they're doing. I would encourage pastors who couldn't do that, for example, Maybe if you just decide, hey, I'm going to get online on Instagram Live, I don't know, every day, and I'm going to, at 4 o'clock, I'm going to do 4 o'clock prayers, or I'm going to do a, a 9 for 9, right? 9 for 9. 9 minutes at 9 a.m., I'm going to do a 9-minute devotion every single day to encourage you on how you can overcome anxiety, how you can overcome fear, how you can overcome stress, how you can lead your family during this period, how you can talk about the coronavirus with your kids, whatever it might be. Like they're the pieces of content that we could be producing now, because we're not worried about whether or not the 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 floor of the of the uh, church got cleaned or anything along those lines. Like leverage your time just slightly differently. The content doesn't have to be amazingly produced. It just needs to be real. It needs to be raw. I was speaking with a pastor just yesterday, who was testing me, saying, "Hey, I haven't really known what to do with the whole online thing. So here's what I've been doing. I've just." going to YouTube every single day doing a live thing directly from my phone it's not great quality as I walk around my neighborhood and I've just been taking prayer requests on YouTube 
I, I texted him back and I said, dude, that's fantastic. Like, what's the response been? He goes, we've had more views than ever before. More views than anything we've ever produced. I'm like, I'm not surprised because people are wanting to keep themselves occupied and they're looking to the church to provide hope and to provide encouragement, which realistically, Phil, this is what we're supposed to have been doing all along. We're yeah. supposed to have been people's lives providing encouragement and hope. Now just people have seen that they need it more than ever. The church has seen people need this more than ever, so they're going out of their way to do it. So produce whatever content it is that's going to best suit you and the way that God wired you and the way that God gifted you. Maybe maybe you don't feel comfortable speaking to a camera like this. You feel better writing. Write a blog. Write a, like a Do a mini blog on your Instagram. Literally, that's what I do every single day. It's a mini blog on my Instagram account. That's all it is, and it's a Bible devotion. Do stuff like that that puts your content out in a way that God wired you to get it out and allows you to connect with the people who are in your church, who God has called you to shepherd. Um, that's that's what it's really all about. I love that. I you know I like the idea of starting with who you are and starting with your people. Like start with yeah. that intersection and yeah. create something and experiment. I think that's a, a key word. Is yeah. You're not committing yourself to doing this forever. But I also think don't assume that you're going to stop it in eight weeks if you find something that really builds traction, because yep. you may find that you've got a way to reach your congregation in a way that you've never done before, and, or it might help you to reach people that you've never been able to reach before, and you find that you really like it. And you may say, you know, some of the things we used to do really weren't that effective, but we didn't know what to do instead because we've always done it yeah. this way. Well, now all of a yeah. sudden, what, what we've always done can't work. So experiment. And if something's not working, it's okay. Stop it and find something else, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. If I can bounce on what you just said, it's, it's starting with how God has wired you and also starting, uh, then the next thing is starting with how he's wired you and where he's placed you. You might be uh, watching this or listening to this and going, well, my that's all great and all, but my congregation is mostly seniors and, and they don't know how to use Facebook or they don't know how to use Instagram. I don't want to say that as a generalization. I'm just using it as an example, right? Well, there's other things you can do because you've got a phone. You could call everybody. Like mm -hmm. seniors know how to use a phone, right? So mm -hmm. call them and get your content out that way. Record robocall if that's what's required. Well, text them stuff. Like I said, texting is super intimate. So text, like do long text. There, there is multiple things we can do regardless of where you are, regardless of what your uh, community, your church community looks like. There, there are ways that you can stay connected with people if you start to process it uh, differently. And as I said, isolation breeds creativity. So start being a little bit more creative in your approach. The message never changes, right? But the way that we deliver the message does. Uh, the vessel that it comes in changes. And so we just need to make sure that we're making this digital space, if that's what we're using, making this a sacred space as well. Amen. I'm literally, you've been talking about some of the guys that you stay connected with. I'm just going to use this as an example of different groups that I'm part of. So I'm a part of a group that's based in text, but then we have a weekly Zoom call. I'm part of another group that's based in Facebook, a Facebook private secret group, but we also do a weekly Zoom call. I'm part of another text group that we don't meet. We've only met once in the history of this group, and it's been going for a couple of years, but we have occasional emails, but we have pretty regular uh, text group messages that go out. Mm. I'm part of another group that has never met. It's only on Voxer, which is audio only and text, and we yeah. meet that way, and it's an accountability group. Every one of them is fashioned to the uniqueness of the group. And there's so many, and all of them serve me and I serve them in unique ways. And I think that's what's amazing is I think we can find what really does connect with uh, the group that we're trying to serve. So um, I want to bring this yeah. to a close here. You, you said something that's, I think, really important for, for pastors to remember. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in his study on Tipping Point discovered that there's this rule of 140. And I don't know what the number is when it comes to what a digital pastor, how many people we can serve. But the rule of 140 is that's about the size of group that one person can really know pretty intimately. You know, whether it's 100, 200, 
even in, in the church planting world, I've been part of the church planting world. There's a point in, in that intersection where you need a second pastor yeah. because you can't get to know intimately the people um, in your church when it gets beyond that. And that's why I think churches like yours and churches like, um, you know, Life Church and all those have campus pastors and many campus pastors yeah. because you know that you can't really get into the lives of people well enough if you're trying to care for a thousand people or five thousand yeah. and it'll kill you i've I've seen a pastor who ended up in the hospital because he wanted to know the intimate details of 800 people in his church you just can't do it and so i think yeah. that really speaks to the value of the local church and the local community and what god has really called us as pastors to do you have a response i can tell <laughs> 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 yeah, there is a tipping point for sure, and and this is where um, I think if we're able to leverage, uh, you know, if pastors are able to leverage social media a lot better, it allows people more people to be connected with us, and that in turn allows us to pass to them better, um, and it creates this intimacy that just physical as, isn't able to do anymore. Um, like you say, I know most churches in America are under a hundred. Um, but there are churches that are over that. And if we get to this tipping point of, uh, of 140 people, and, and I think you're right in church planning world, I think it's around the 140 to 200 point where people start to, churches start to take on a, a second pastoral role. Um, then we need to be leveraging it, regardless of the size of your church, the more that you can leverage social media for stuff that's real, for stuff that's authentic, for stuff that is genuine, rather than just taking photos of, your food or or the plane window as you're flying somewhere on vacation or whatever it might be start leveraging it for connecting with people i think that's where uh, i think that's where we make a difference like i said earlier right um, engagement is the king of social media not content content is queen um it's the engagement and so i i tell pastors all the time phil that uh, when it comes to social media um, my formula has boiled down to this, this simple, simple thing. Question marks are greater than periods. Question marks are greater than periods. If you just put a statement out there, hey, I'm on vacation today, you're not inviting people into anything. But if you're asking them a question, you're inviting them into a conversation and you're inviting them to get to know you a little bit better. If you say, hey, I'm reading the Gospel of John this week, what are you reading? that invites them into a conversation where you can start to get to know them a little bit better. Um, or if you post a Bible verse, and, and this is one of the things I've been talking about for a little bit at the moment, it seems to be very uh, relevant right now. People who just post a Bible verse and that's it. Um, post a Bible verse for sure if you're a pastor, but post a question beyond that. Tell people why you posted that, what it means to you, and then ask them, what does it mean to you? What does that verse mean to you? And then get that conversation happening. That allows you to be a pastor seven days a week, not just on Sundays. And I think that's that for me is the key. That's where that tipping point starts to uh, move towards our favor, right, as pastors and as church leaders. It moves in our favor. A lot of people would say that they know me. I've got 50,000 people who follow me on uh, on Instagram. They know me, though, because I'm real on that, and I ask questions, and I engage. I respond to every comment, and I respond by name. I make it personal. That's what I think the difference is. We need to, pastors need to make it personal when it comes to their social media or whatever content they're putting out there during this period. Make it personal. If you're a pastor, make it personal. I love that quote. Question marks are greater than periods. And so we're going to end with a question mark. Yeah. Ozzy, Dave, how can we pray for you? Oh, man. First of all, I'm touched of all the conversations that I've had. This is the first time anybody has asked me that. So thank you, Phil. That speaks volumes to what I said before. You are a pastor by purpose. If you can pray for me, here's, here's my prayer. I'm anxious. I'm fearful. I'm anxious about my work. I'm anxious about my job, if I'm really honest. I'm anxious about my family and their health. So please uh, be praying for, for me as a dad that I am bringing a sense and a spirit of peace to my wife and to my three girls uh, because that's what I want. But I want that to be born not not out of me putting on a mask, but out of a genuine sense of peace in my own spirit. Um, I think it's starting to grow there, 
but I would ask you to be praying for me that um, that sense of peace, that shalom that only God can give uh, would, would really just uh, not just not just hmm. shining me, but it would leak out of me. Hmm. All right. Well, would you allow me to pray that for you as we close our time here? hundred percent. And I'm going to pray that for you and everyone who listens to this, because I think we all need that right now. Yeah, for sure. Father, I thank you that um, that you have come to bring us peace, that you've promised peace as one of the fruits of your spirit, your spirit's deep work in us that also brings us joy, that builds our faith, that gives us visions and dreams. That, um, but Lord, when we come to you and pray with our for our anxieties and we bring our gratitude, you've told us that after we pray, you're going to give us a peace that passes understanding, a, a peace that we can't manufacture by ourselves, a peace that might we, we might get a momentary breath of it or taste of it when we do deep breathing, but you've promised a deeper peace. So I want to pray for, for Dave. I want to pray for myself. I want to pray for each person that listens to this, Lord, that as we look at the circumstances around us and it seems like shifting sand, it seems like it's an earthquake, mm. it, it feels like a tsunami, it feels just unnavigable. Um, I pray, Lord, that in the midst of this, that we would have peace. I pray yes. for Dave's ability to love and lead his family and be okay that he doesn't mm. have the answers, but Lord, that he'd have a deep security because you do. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will give him just the ability to press into each conversation, each thing that you call him to do the rest of today and each day this week, Lord, that he would be able to serve well and feel the ushering of your power, your peace, and your presence with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, thank you for this conversation. I pray, Lord, that something that we've said today will help a church, a pastor, a, a man in the pew, a woman in the pew to exercise a little bit more faith and to reach out and to um, befriend someone and to share the gospel and to share the power of the kingdom with someone in their sphere of influence. We pray this to your glory for your purposes in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, man. I really appreciate, appreciate that. You bet. I'm going to bring this to a close. Oh, well, before I do. Um, tell everyone where should they go to learn more about the Hebrew devotions or the book you've done or anything. What's the best place to go? Yeah, uh, so following me on Instagram, Aussie Dave, A U S S I E Dave, uh, is the, probably the best way to, to get most of my content. Uh, on Twitter, Aussie Dave as well. On Facebook, Aussie Dave, A U S S I E D A V E. And um, like I said earlier on, I, I, I post for probably it's probably stupid that i do this but i post my uh phone number out so people can always text me for prayer requests or anything like that so if that's something that you know your listeners your viewers want to do 201-267-2156 i'll make sure to put that into the comments as well 201-267-2156 i'm just here to pray for people i just want to help i want to help i want to help pastors i want to help followers of jesus i want to help the church get um, get go further faster and get them you know do everything they can to help the people around them as well I appreciate what you do um, I'm gonna ask one more question keep it live here keep it real and raw you say on your uh, your website I believe and maybe on Instagram too that you're a musician and I didn't know that I'm a musician yeah. what does that mean what kind of music do you do uh, so I play guitar. Um, I've been playing guitar since I was probably 20 years old, um, and uh, I don't get to do it as much these days because I'm I'm um, just so busy with online stuff. But my wife and I were just talking about this today. You know, I was, I was uh, having a look at my amp and and the tubes that have to go into my amp. So I play guitar, and I, I luckily I, I'm so thrilled that my eldest daughter plays guitar now as well. So I get to to play with her from time to time as well. I try well, to do a little bit of everything, Phil. That's the key. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a, I'm known as a Swiss Army knife. Um, you know, <laughs> I play guitar right now. I'm playing more piano and saxophone. Um, oh, wow. I write songs. I was a worship pastor for a long time, so that's wow. kind of where I got my start. But more of a jazz saxophonist. But during this time of uh, you know quarantine, I'm I'm playing piano right now because I don't have my guitar or my saxophone with me. So that's awesome. <laughs> Um, just, you know, and trying to maybe get back into writing some songs. So let's, awesome. let's do it, man. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you for being a part of this conversation. We'll get this uh, published to all the places uh, in the near future. Great. Thank you so much, Phil.